Hello. All right. Uh, kitty cat. Uh, okay. Wait. You are. No. <laughs> kitty cat. Yeah. Well, as I said, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Do you want to clap? Yeah. One, two, three. Nice. nice. First try. All right. Keith, what's going on? You joining me in the that chapter podcast studio? I don't know. I was kind of making that up on the fly. Yeah. Uh, once again, thanks for being here back again for another episode. Of course. Thank Feels you good. for having me. Appreciate it. Mm. Good to be back. Yeah, well, you uh, you better appreciate it because... <laughs> this is the last time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> so what's new with you? What's new with you? Question mark at the end of that sentence. Keith, what's up? Not much. Uh, what is going on? What is happening? That's just a delicious sparkling water I just opened there. Talk. We're looking for the pants, is it? Mm-hmm. What's happening in my life? Uh, moved into a new house. Oh, yeah. Yeah, were you looking at my notes? I might be. You were. That was like my first thing. Is that the audience wants to know more about Keith. You know, we've had you on... This is uh, fourth? Technically... No, wait. Fourth, technically fifth, because we still have the unreleased vampire episode, the Rod Farrell one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to go as a bonus episode. So the reason for the folks at home, well, we haven't released it, is because we recorded it somewhere else, and the audio quality was not very good. Uh, We recorded in my kitchen, because, as we all know, it is an excellent idea to record a podcast in where there is tiles (laughs) and very hard surfaces, because that always sounds real good in your ear. If you know anything about acoustics. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's the way you want to go. Yeah. So, um, it's a funny-ass episode, though. I mean... I had fun. I don't care. At this moment, I enjoyed <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. I enjoyed it. That's what matters. Um, <laughs> I had my fun. <laughs> exactly. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. We're not getting paid for this. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> no sponsors. Not yet. Not yet, yeah. Um, but yeah, Keith, mm. as I said, right, you're always distracting me. You're always doing that. You get those big pearly blues staring at me. Um, so yeah, Keith, yes. uh, who I've known since I was, I don't know, knee high to a grasshopper. You might say, a baba, a wee, a wee young lad. Keith, you recently moved home. List your address for all the folks at home. <laughs> Do you want a full address? A full address, the air code included, code phone yeah, number, yeah. private email address, your boss's phone number. <laughs> Give me it all. I'll put it all down, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Give it to me now. But uh, get folks at home, get a, get a load of this. Keith's new house is, dare I say, is it haunted? Yes, it is. It, it could be. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, so we moved into, which it is, it's a little sad moving because we moved closer to Dublin. Where we've you been moved away from me, you I fucking know. asshole. We've been neighbours for our whole lives. And then, but hopefully. Not anymore, not anymore. thanks anymore. to you. Yeah, but the plan is you'll hopefully move out towards me again. We've been neighbours soon again. But anyway, we got no. a. <laughs> I guess that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> But uh, yeah, traitor. The house it was so it's a it's a house in Dublin and it was built in the 1930s. But so we got the house, we done the look around. Uh, but when we moved in, we properly searched the house. And we went up into the attic and on mm. the attic we found Ooh. inscribed Ooh. into the wall, into the concrete, names and dates with RIP on the needles. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, I showed it's, you the video. Right? Yeah, exactly. Maybe you know what? Maybe we should post the video uh, like on the Instagram or something oh, when I'm yeah. posting this this episode of the podcast so people at home can see it. Or yeah. I'll link it maybe in the description of this podcast. That'd be good. So yeah. people can watch it. Yeah, that would yeah. be a good idea because it is pretty creepy. Because it's two different names mm. and it's both the exact same date. It's like 1937. Yeah. Or RIP. Two separate names of yeah. two separate people, obviously. On the but same it has date. dates under them. And they both, so assuming they both died on the same day. Apparently so. And this is car, like in the concrete from 1939 yeah. in your attic. It's very, very weird. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's fairly creepy. Um, so far, no, like, ghost sightings yet. And there's um, no history that you know of, of, like, a house fire I, or... No, I looked. I looked, like, I searched. Murderers. Serial, serial killers. The I house? Dro- yeah, no, I looked around. I, I uh, snooped around. Snoop around. Yeah, snoop around. I had yeah. a look around and, no, I didn't find anything, which is strange. So, but, yeah, no ghost sightings yet. We did notice a couple of strange things. Like, for example, like, the back door when, like, we'd both be, like, myself and... Uh, the missus. Yeah. Uh, be, Say her yeah. name <laughs> and her date of birth and her social security number. We Don't like, be shy. So sure that like we'd lock the back door. Yeah. But then like we'd come down the next morning to be open. You know what I mean? So wow. just a little strange. I think thing you're just it. being burgled. Could be like it's either it's 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 either burglary or it's some sort of old timey ghost. See, prank. you're not noticing. See, you're being burgled, but you have nothing of interest. So the burglars is coming in. 
fuck this. And that's why nothing's being stolen. Like, oh, yeah. Leaving this stuff. This is shit. Sure <laughs> this is leaving. Yeah, exactly. They bring your stuff. They feel sorry. Yeah, just drop off a fiver. <laughs> yeah, <poor> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, all that, interestingly enough, takes us to today's tale of a guy breaking in. But he didn't feel sorry for these people. He... He asked them a question, dare I say. Oh, See what I did there? Nice, that was good. Thank you. That was off, that was off, that was off the dome, <laughs> too. Me and my ad-libbing. People at home don't notice, I ad-lib a lot in my videos. You do, yeah. I ad-lib a lot. You I'm in the podcast. Quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, I know. I just generally just talk shite, <laughs> <laughs> which is what I'd call. Hey, man, it's working. Thank you. Well, sometimes. This old story uh, is, a, is a story of a horrifying serial killer who prowled the streets of New Orleans in the early 1900s, the city of New Orleans, mm. unlike old or Orleans, uh, which is in France, I think. I'd imagine it's the old Orleans is in France. I don't, have you ever heard of old Orleans? Maybe it's just called Orleans. New Orleans in the year 1918, if you can imagine that. What was the city of New Orleans like back in the year 1918? I mean, I've never been there in 2023, but hmm. I've heard it's an awesome city. Uh, everybody I know who has been to New Orleans has said it is phenomenally cool. Seems uh, like a cool real city. neat place. Cool, yeah. kind of gothic. Go to Bourbon Street, yeah. have a few sips, cocktails, listen to some jazz music. Sounds yeah. awesome. Yeah, I was, I was looking up about it and um, around this time, let me... Yeah. Let me set the scene a little bit with it. Do so, you? during the first half of the 19th century, New Orleans, or New Orleans, it was one of, if not, the wealthiest city in the United States. Wow. It was the third largest city uh, with one of the largest ports in the world. However, it wasn't all Mardi Gras and Carnival. And Chicks getting their baps out for the yeah, lads, throwing yeah. beads at them. Yeah. Hey, and jambalaya. Hey. Have you ever had jambalaya? Uh, yes, I have actually. It's delicious. It is delicious. Yeah. It's really tasty. It is. It's very good. But there was also a darker side to mm. New Orleans Ooh. with organized crime and a seedy red light district. Nice. Um, the red light district is, it's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, it was an area, it was called Storyville and it operated from 1897 to 1917. And it was a 38 block area where Anything goes. Yeah, that's what I like to hear. Yeah, man. So it was a it was Sick. a hot, it was it was a hotbed of brothels and jazz bars ding, and ding, crime dance. Ding. It was yeah. It was happening. yeah. It sounds awesome. Right. I, I want to go there. Is it still around? Oh no, no you said it ended in nineteen. It ended in nineteen seventeen. Yeah, and Fucking it was man shut it down. Yeah, the man. Dur during the time it was it was a very popular district. Uh, for some reason I can't imagine. Um, <laughs> but so much so that there was blue books that were published in Storyville. Uh, ah. So these books, they were like guides to prostitution the for visitors. The best was in town. Pretty much, dude. Pretty <laughs> much. It was, uh, yeah, there were guides to the, to the district um, for users wishing to use services. So they included um, house descriptions, prices, particular services, and the stock of each house offered. So like the names of the women, the race, the religion, and the services that they offered. I like it had their religion. Yeah, just in case that was important to you. Right, yeah. I don't know what... You know. But, yeah. No, like, that, that's a deal breaker. Exactly. <laughs> you know, she better be a, better be a good Christian girl. <laughs> but, like, it's, so it said she was, like, a menu of uh, the, the babes in town. Disturbingly enough, yes. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, when you put it like that, it's... Whew, yeah. Woof. However, all good things do come to an end, and the Red Light District was ordered to be shut down by midnight of November 12th, 1917. Um, the reason for this was because the US, they just joined... World War One and mm. New Orleans was a major port for shipping right. out young lads to war. Unfortunately for some, the red light district was something of a distraction for these young men. Uh, in the early days of the war, four soldiers were actually killed uh, within the district within weeks of each other. So with the military, they, they shut it down. And How, then, like killed, like probably drinking and like drinking fucking and around. fighting and just, yeah, just getting up to no good. Yeah. So... They, so the military, they decided, can't have this. They shut it down. And then one year later, a darker tale emerged from New Orleans. A tale of a next murder. Yes, it did indeed. That takes us to the year 1918. Though the, the war, it was, it was coming close to an end. Uh, Europe and many other parts of the world were, were ravaged by years of ferocious fighting in the trenches and all that sort of stuff. As we, let's go through a brief history of World War One from start to finish. <laughs> Austria Hungary. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah, World War One World War One sucked. Have you ever like have you ever listened to Dan Carlin's blueprint for Armageddon? It's 
the podcast. He's you know Doug Carl. He's a, like a historian podcaster. Mm. He has a series called Blueprint for Armageddon. Right. It's like fucking fifteen hours long podcast, <laughs> but essentially it's like World War One from start to finish. It's super super interesting, right. um, and that'll just give you a good idea of how shite it was. <laughs> Uh, but thankfully, we are going to New Orleans, which was not involved in any of the fighting. But something you should know about this time is that New Orleans, it was a hot spot of immigration. Soldiers going out, folk coming in, uh, specifically uh, specifically from Italy, which in World War One, that's the war when the Italians were the good guys. Mm. Or at least, you know, we're on the side of the winners, which automatically kind of just makes them the good guys, I guess. Winners write history and all that kind of stuff. So... There was a lot of Italians coming in um, to New Orleans around this time. And I mean, you know, not just New Orleans, New York, New Jersey, all the Sopranos, the Godfather. Like, this is the time when all of them were, he's coming from the old country, your yeah. grandfather, he's from the that <laughs> shit, you know. So essentially, you can, thanks for the mafia. Like, this is literally when the mafia was kind of, the American mafia was formed. Yeah. And which also means, thanks for some of the greatest movies and TV shows of all time. Exactly. And you know, thanks for all the food. The delicious, delicious I, food. Yeah, so worth it yeah. overall. I think so. So, you know, most of these Italians, though, who were who are coming into town, they were just looking to make a regular old new life. You, you know, you had your small minority of gangsters and stuff like that, the Costa Nostra and all that. Uh, and that will play a little bit of a part in the story. But most regular everyday folk. And so all this began. New Orleans, a hotspot of new cultures coming in and years in a period of war. That's when a sick murderer began to strike. And it all began in the early hours of May 23rd, 1918. Or rather, that is when the aftermath of a vicious murder was discovered that would lead to a reign of terror so horrifying that it has drawn comparisons to... Saucy Jack! Oh. Ooh, the Jackster! So where, you know, whereas Jack the Ripper has five canonical victims or victims that are usually just like this is Jack the Ripper's victims. There's mm. always other one or two. Ooh, maybe he did this. Maybe he did yeah. that. There's like, but like five for sure. The Axeman of New Orleans, as he would become known, did better than Jack mm. with six victims. Good for him. Well, no. Yeah, I mean, fair play. Fair <laughs> play to you on that one. <laughs> Though, having said that, there have been uh, quite a few more in and around the vicinity of the Axeman's axe that are attributed to them, but some don't share the elements of the other murders. So, with that, let's focus on the six core victims of the New Orleans Axeman. And we'll, we'll touch on some of the more speculative cases. And first, we gotta talk about Joseph Maggio and his wife, Catherine. Now, the Maggios lived in a house adjacent to their small business. Now, almost all, but not specifically all, of the cases of the Axeman's victims, they lived in the old city of New Orleans. Think around the French Quarter, that part of town. What would, I guess, really be kind of like central New Orleans today? Back then, it just would have been, this is the city. Now, together, the couple, Joseph and Catherine, they were a perfect example of enterprising Italian immigrants, which made them prime targets for extortion and exploitation by the Mafia. Mm -hmm. The Maggios, they ran a grocery store and a small bar room. So you can imagine mobsters coming in and, hey, be a, hey, be a shame if something happened to your bar, you know what I'm saying? A certain somebody may or may not break your legs if you don't get the money. <laughs> yeah. Hey, <capisce? laughs> That's exactly it. That was probably the best Italian accent I've ever heard. I, if I closed my eyes, I felt like I was in a surprise. Oh, right there. That was so good. All week. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, the podcasters can't even see, so they probably just... <laughs> They'll think you're talking. <laughs> so we will never know what exactly happened to the Maggios that evening in May 1918. But the gruesome aftermath was discovered by Joseph's brother, Andrew. And I painted a pretty good picture of the order of events and even the killer's method of entry. In fact, so much was left behind that had the investigators had access to even minor modern investigative techniques, it's likely the killer would not have gone unknown for very long at all. Like, the evidence that was left behind in this case would have made this extremely hmm. solvable in today's age, but we are not talking about today's age, we're talking over a hundred years ago. Hmm. Can I shock you? Over a hundred years ago? Things are a little bit different. I'm shocked. Here's my shock face. Uh, it's very shocked. Folks at home, if you could see Keith, you would say, <gasps> that's, a, that's a shocked man right now. <laughs> they had like, they had fingerprinting around the time, but it wasn't standard procedure. It was more like, um, hey, I got some fingerprints. Great. What do we do with them? I don't know. 
Yeah, I don't know. Well, they look like art. I don't know what you're going to do with them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, great. Thanks. Throw them <laughs> in the bin. <laughs> Now, the bloody hangover of the violent intrusion was discovered when Andrew and Jake, the younger brothers of Joseph, returned home to the house next door after a night out of town. Few, few glug lugs, few sups. Lads, 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 lads. lads. <laughs> now, Andrew and Jake, they didn't actually realize anything was wrong at first when they got home next door. It wasn't until after they'd laid down to sleep and the room starts spinning. Is there anything worse than when you're having a few beers and get home and the room starts spinning? Oh, uh, you get the spinnies. Oh, it is the worst yeah. thing possible. It's and the you worst. you just know. It's like, oh, I'm going to vomit. Yeah, this is not going to end well. <laughs> I haven't had that in a while, thankfully. I think I'm just getting older, so yeah. I just know not to be it stupid and drink that much anymore. Yeah, but yeah. God damn, it's the, it is, it the, is worst. the worst feeling in the world. It still happens every now and again. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God, it's rough. Well, that's why I sympathize with our friend Andrew over here. So he was in that position. He was in his bed, room started spinning, when he heard a strange gurgling and moaning coming through the wall, mm. which is Joseph and Catherine's room. Now, at first, mamma mia, <laughs> someone's getting a cannoli out, you know what I'm saying? But that changed after a few moments. Andrew knew he wasn't hearing, uh, you know, something kind of funky going on. So after knocking a few times and receiving no answer to their calls, Andrew and Jake nervously entered the couple's home and then their brother's room where they were met with the horrific view of their brother and sister-in-law's bodies laying on blood-drenched sheets. Worst of all, Joseph, he was still in the final throes of death, and he only succumbed to death <laughs> minutes after being found. Catherine, she was already gone, and her body was in a very sorry state indeed. Not only had she had her head bashed in with the weapon that would be, well, many would come to fear it, her head had almost been completely severed from her body. Mm. Now, Joseph, he hadn't fared much better. His throat was also slit, though not so deep as to make his death imminent, but or immediate, but it was fairly imminent. He'd also been beaten about the head with the Axeman's signature weapon. Yeah, he was really making sure he got the job done. Wasn't he? Exactly. No That's... mucking about, right? Yeah. He was a man on a mission. He said, listen here, lads, got one job to do and I'm going to make sure I get it done. <laughs> Fair play to him. I mean, he's thorough. Yeah. Give that. <laughs> Police officers, they were on the scene quickly, and they immediately knew how a man, soaked in the couple's blood, had walked out of the house and away without anyone noticing. He hadn't. Whoever did this didn't turn invisible. They just found a change of clothes at the crime scene, which is extremely odd. Covering crimes, like on YouTube, on that chapter, I don't think I've ever come across a case where the killer changes his clothes at the crime scene. And leaves them there. Yeah, and leaves the <laughs> bloody pile of clothes in the corner, which is very, very weird. And these clothing, they didn't give anything to the police back then. They were found to be just mass-reduced shite. They could have belonged to anyone. They weren't identifiable. But again, if this had been today's day, that's probably why nobody does it today. Because yeah. DNA. They would have, if the, you know, the DNA would solve that. And further searches of the Maggio's home, they turned up very little, but did allow the police to rule out robbery as a motive. Cash and other valuables were left in plain sight in the home. See, of course, the police had first thought. The brutal demise of the Maggio's was a clear and obvious case of what we'd been talking about earlier. That the couple had turned down an offer they could not refuse, and, well, this is what happens if you refuse. But if it was the Mafia, the dare I say... You know, the thing that doesn't exist, as they say, wink, wink, no, no. Uh, well, I mean, you know, if it was the mafia, why would they leave money and cash behind? Yeah, if that they was the whole... That's the whole thing. Of, yeah, that was, right? that, that was the whole thing. Exactly, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. going to get money, but we're going to leave the money. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, so retaliation by pissed off extortionists was looking a, a lot less likely. Uh, you know, so first thought of the mafia, but swiftly, they weren't so sure. Ha ha ha. The killer's way in was found to be fairly obvious how he entered the home. Not only did the investigators find a damaged window pane in the door, but they also found a discarded screwdriver that, mar that matched the marks of the tool used to pry it open. So the lack of a motive, I mean, what's the motive other than murder itself? It wasn't mm. theft, it wasn't robbery. That wasn't, that was not the only weird thing about this. It's very unusual, as I said, for murder to be the aim of the crime itself. You know, as I said, usually you're murdering to do something. Robbery, life insurance, something like that. Revenge. Hmm. And it's also highly uncommon for a killer who goes to a scene intending to kill, which this guy must have done, to go without a weapon. Hmm. The brutal murder weapon, the axe, was the Maggio's own axe. Ooh, is the axe haunted? 
<laughs> so this, this is something that we're going to see again and again in the uh-huh. Mur- in Yoda Mur- 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 murders, where he sort of kind of more just he sort of accidentally became an axe murder. Yeah, um, as I said like he would just use whatever was available at the time, and he just kept finding axes. Yeah, these people. Everybody had one. Yeah, everyone had an axe. Yeah. It's like having an, it's like an AR-15. You just keep <laughs> finding them everywhere. There's around. Everybody's just got one. They're all over Yeah. I think if I knew that someone was breaking into the house using items to kill me from within my own home, the first mm. thing I do was get rid of all the axes. That would be a good idea. Yeah. But I think then, that's a bit of common sense. That would be good. Well, what are you going to do then to cut your firewood? That's why everybody had axes to cut firewood. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess like the second thing I'd do, I'd do would be I'd leave things around the house that I'd want to be killed with. Ah, mm. so I like, like it. A load of bottles of whiskey. Yeah, he kill me with in, this. And he's like, oh, no, I have to drink myself oh, to death. Oh, yeah. Ah, ah, just, God damn, maybe ah, I can kill someone dude. with this. Fuck, I might even start without him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. Someone broke in, picked up an axe that was likely laying around for firewood, and then went into the bedroom and swung away at a sleeping Joseph and Catherine. And the next discovery brought the first and only suspect when investigators discovered the tool used to slit Joseph's throat and almost decapitate Catherine. That was a bloodstained razor discovered discarded in a neighbor's lawn, Mm. just thrown about willy nilly. And that razor just so happened to belong to Andrew, the brother and fellow entrepreneur who owned a barbershop nearby. See, this way you shouldn't bring your work home with you. No, see, listen, that's what I keep telling you guys. <laughs> leave it home. Leave you off to turn off the door. Home. Leave exactly. It the door. Yeah, yeah. You're a different man now. <laughs> Just leave it at home. I can't take it anymore. This is your time. Relax. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is your time. Get the axe out. Like <laughs> Try something new. <laughs> take your mind off. Andrew uh, told investigators he had taken the blade home for sharpening a couple of days before the murders. But how had it now gone missing? Mm-hmm. That's actually interesting. How had it gone missing? He So he works as a barber, so he obviously uses a straight razor all yeah. the time. And now it just disappeared. Like, had the had he left the straight razor in his brother's home? Had the killer broken into Andrew's home also and taken it while they were out drinking wine in Sambuca? Because that's... Uh, yeah. What else do Italians drink other than wines? You know, I like, how did he get the straight razor mm-hmm. if it wasn't Joseph or Catherine's? Because it does seem after that he was, like, stalking his home for, it, like, a little bit. Um watching it and so he might have yet yeah, broken in there first knowing what was in there or maybe he kind of broke in there first and yeah. hoping to kill them inside uh, Andrew's... and then they weren't there and then it's like I'll go next door no spoilers but Andrew's story is very shady I mean first of all um, like when he when he was asked why he hadn't heard the intruder at his brother's house right prior to hearing the gurgling the, you know yeah. next door and then he that's what he, he said he'd been out drinking yeah right so he hadn't heard anything as an intruder was in his brother's room, which is true of probably a very thin wall, beating them up with an axe. But he heard a dying man's gurgles, right? right? Yeah. And he's like, oh, I didn't hear anything because of the drink, right? That's just like some weird selective hearing yeah, there. Yeah. And then, I mean, wouldn't Andrew have gotten his brother's store when he died, uh, right? And then also... He's got a lot to gain. Yes, and then there's also the, one of the other things that kind of made the police leave Andrew like off the hook was Andrew said, oh, I seen a suspicious man hanging around spying on them, right? Or in the area in the days prior. Mm. And ah, uh, yeah, there's some guy that I sw- oh, God, oh, yeah, there was a guy there, I swear. He was like suspicious like though, so. He was just out in the garden just practicing a, his axe swings. Yeah, <laughs> oh, you wouldn't you believe it. Been? Yeah, if I see him again, I'll let you know. <laughs> It's like, yeah, Andrew's story is very, like... Wishy-washy. Yeah, right? Like, it's just very, very weird. But, um, again, you know, everybody had axes in this time. It was a time of great people in the society, so who knows? But um, there's no obvious suspects left and no survivors or witnesses to the actual crime. So the trail of the Axeman, it quickly went cold. And, of course, rumors that were flying around the local community... Many, many blamed, still blamed the Mafia, though it's not something you would say too loudly for fear of a reprisal. Though, of course, the Mafia were like, yeah, we fucking did it. Yeah, of course yeah. they were, yeah. yeah, we're, yeah. Fu- we're cool motherfuckers. <laughs> why, like, why wouldn't they? Yeah, exactly. They would want to seem pretty badass. And so everything was fairly quiet, and the Maggio's brutal deaths were considered a tragic but ultimately isolated incident until just over a month later, when the Axeman would strike again. 
So not much of a cooling off period there. No. Only a month. Yeah, only a month. Another couple, Louis Bessemer and his mistress Harriet Lowe, were attacked in the early hours of June 27th, 1918. That's not how you want to get caught with your mistress. No, I know. I mean, he's French, so he pretty no, like there's, five mistresses. Though. Yeah, there's no talking away about that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think he gave a shit. He's French, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> um, the scene of the crime was discovered at around 7 a.m. by a baker named John Zanka, who was delivering goods to Bessemer's grocery store. Again, fairly central, like New Orleans, but not terribly close to where the Maggios lived. It's like on the other side of the city, but still mm. kind of central enough. Uh, it was in a, a part of the city where all the street names are French. Yeah. You know, Wee Wee Street, J'adore Baguette Street, that kind of stuff, you know. Voulez-vous coucher avec moi Street, that kind of stuff, all that kind of shit. Right. And that's the extent of your French language. That is the that's extent. That's even of, Yes, uh, I thought it was pretty good. I was yeah, on a roll there. Good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So John Zanka, he felt compelled to investigate as he received no replies despite knocking and calling out several times. And it, just, it was a very routine delivery, regular occurrence. And Bessemer was never tardy, never late. Mm. And so he ventured in and he discovered the two in a puddle of each other's blood in a boarding room adjoining Bessemer's grocery store. The axe, actually a hatchet to be precise, once again belonged to Bessemer, and it was found still stained with blood in the bathroom of the property, indicating that the killer may have gone to the bathroom to clean off after the crime. Bessemer, he had a fractured skull, the result of being hit with the blunt side of his own hatchet, while Harriet Lowe had been hit with the sharpened blade over her left ear, leaving her with a deep and spurting squirt squirt wound. Mm. Like the Maggio attack, however, both Lewis and Harriet they'd survive first of all I just would like to say what a delivery man like if that mm. was my postman I'd still be there no oh, yeah 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 he, exactly you'd be like oh they're not there fine fuck him next time <laughs> yeah. he like barely even knocks anymore just like yeah he just the package barely the even delivers the letters yeah. throws it at my in my general direction it's like yeah <laughs> also I feel a lot could be resolved with better axe control that's a hot topic. Do you, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> axe reform now. Axe reform now. You get these axes off, off the, the streets. streets. You know what would have stopped Louis Bessemer from being killed? More axes than If he had his own axe. Yeah. Oh, wait, he did have his own axe. Oh, yeah. Shit. Yeah. Okay, my argument's already been defeated. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, their statements. Harry, by the way, this is a non political podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to be like one of those podcasts, I feel like, for those listening at home. It's like, we, we agree with whatever you agree with. Let's just be real fence sitters when it comes to political shit and just like totally bitch out and everything. Yeah, I can sit in fence. I could go balance. So, you had Lewis and Harriet, who were both attacked a month after the Maggios were horribly killed, but both Lewis and Harriet would survive. However, unfortunately, their statements, Harriet's in particular, did very little to advance the investigation. And if anything, it only muddied the waters even further of what had really happened. It's fair enough. Like, she caught an axe to, she, to the dome. So. She did, yeah. She took a rough one right yeah. in the face, you know. She fucking ate that axe. So while Louis Bessemer told police he had been asleep when he was attacked and he had seen nothing at all, Harriet claimed she had woken during the attack and she had seen a, uh, well, the word she used was not politically correct, but let's just say a mixed race man attacking her and Louis. Investigators, however... They were like, all right, mystery solved. They had already knew. They had already gotten their guy. Uh, even when Harriet's statements didn't line up with who they had already planned on pinning the crime on. And then they began just flat out ignoring her and wrote her off as being, oh, you're delirious. You're a delirious woman. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, they unsurprisingly arrested the nearest black man. Classic. Classic. It's, it's comforting to know that as a society, uh, 100 years later, that we've a long way. Mm, yes, this would absolutely never happen today, am I right? 41 year old Louis Obicon had been employed by Bessemer at his store for just over a week prior to the attack. And perhaps in desperation to close the case as quickly as possible and avoid a panic, investigators were quick to write off the crime as a robbery gone wrong, despite, once again, the complete lack of anything being stolen. Even a uh, hundred years ago, the police were, yeah, black guy did it, case closed. Yep. <laughs> So with little other to go on than their own uh, racism, though, the police were eventually forced to release Louis Obicon. Now, prior to the brain surgery, brain surgery, 1918 style brain surgery, how's that sound? This, good. Good. <laughs> this will go well. Uh, so prior to the brain surgery that would, whoa, whoa, end her life a little over a month after the assault. Jeez, a month. 
Yeah, yeah. She so she the axeman had taken an axe to her head, and then a month later she had brain surgery to, I guess, relieve her of her brain. I don't know what how brain surgery would go back in nineteen eighteen, but just try and fix whatever damage had been done. Like nineteen eighteen, like brain surgery was mostly just drilling holes in the head to oh, relieve yeah. the swelling. So. This was like putting a like you know how you corkscrew in a wine bottle. Yeah, yeah. Very similar. God, it's probably pretty much the exact same thing. Like this was even prior to like the ice pick thing yeah, that goes yeah. through your eyeball Le- this the lobotomies yeah yeah this would have been probably like screw like fucking cutting off a square of your s- skull and like put a whisk in there I don't know what they'd be doing Jeez, she had like more tools in her head than a handyman's belt <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Poor> woman. <laughs> yeah. I know I know <laughs> Well, before she even had that brain surgery, she suddenly decided that she remembered everything and get a load of this. It was actually Louis Bessemer himself who had attacked her with his own hatchet. He had attacked her. Mm, Very thick. He he attacked her and then he attacked himself, apparently, according to her. Uh, Well, this is a story Harriet was saying with half her, literally half of her brain was hanging out of her head. But the police were like, oh, right. Well, that makes sense. And so the police arrested Louis Bessemer. Now. I mean, their second suspect, obviously innocent again, but the police were looking to make the charges stick this time. And they used the discovery of several letters written in Yiddish, German and Russian found in his home to stoke rumors of Bessemer being a German spy. World War One still ongoing at this time. All in all, Bessemer was first forced to serve more than nine months in jail and was only acquitted after a jury trial. The jury deliberated for only 10 minutes before returning a not guilty verdict, and Bessemer was released two days later. Now, at this time though, no one linked this to the earlier attack one month prior, the attack on the Maggios. Even though someone broke in, used an axe found at the scene, and attacked two victims in their sleep. And the police also found the method, the entry method, uh, to be the exact same. Yeah, they broke into the, the bottom panel again, mm-hmm, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like he's like making a doggy door. Yeah, exactly, yeah, woof, woof, woof. he's going in there. <laughs> and so, on the very same day Harriet Lowe passed away, on August 5th, 1918, two days after her failed brain surgery, amazingly, brain surgery in 1918, as you said, not great, the Axeman struck again. Ooh. Once more, there were two victims, once again, uh, but this time the two victims were kind of like very different from like previous two victims. See, this time it was Anne Schneider, Anna Schneider, and she was eight months pregnant. Oh, God. When she was attacked in the wee hours of August 5th. The young woman had awoken in her bed at the address on Elmira Avenue, just across the Mississippi River from the French Quarter, in the home she shared with her husband. But she had awoken to an axe. Oh! <laughs> Anna was discovered with her face entirely covered with blood by her husband Ed as he returned home late after after midnight after after work. Now amazingly, Anna recovered and she gave birth to a healthy baby girl just two days after the brutal assault that had left her with deep deep lacerations to the head and to the face. Cool, an axe baby. Yeah, I know, it's it's pretty. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) This comes out immediately, like saying that. Now, Anna claimed to remember nothing of the attack, leaving officers kind of with nothing to to go on. However, um, I must just say, by the way, the attack on Anna, it's one of the more speculative ones. It's like not entirely sure if it was the axe man himself, mainly. Mm. No axe. Ah. Yeah, just, he should really be called the New Orleans Heavy Lamp Man, because that's what was found to have been the item that was used to beat her head in. See, that's what happens when you don't bring your own weapons. I know, yeah. right? Yeah, you get a, a shitty nickname, like the Heavy Lamp Man. If this had been his first crime, he would have been called Lamp Man. Yeah, Lamp yeah. Man. Ooh, it actually kind of sounds kind of cool. I don't lamp know, Axe Man or Lamp Man? I think I'd, I think I'd fare my chances with Lamp Man. Yeah, ah, man, it's tough. It's, that's tough. Lamp man, Is axe it? man. I'm going to put a poll in this at the end of this podcast episode so, and people can vote for which one they think is cooler. Lamp man or axe, axe man. Okay. I think I'd rather a lamp coming at me than an axe though. But. I would, yeah. You've also got the added bonus, uh, bonus of having an electric weapon. It can shock you. Anna wasn't attacked with an axe and none of the windows or doors showed signs of being uh, forced open. And Anna's husband, Ed, he told the police he thought a couple of dollars were missing. So this was likely a robbery, not the axe man. But this kind of sort of became attributed to him just as his panic and rumors started setting in 
in the in New Orleans. Like it may not have been him, but it definitely added to the fervor of, of you know a killer on the loose. Mm -hmm. At police, they, however, in this one, they did arrest a known convict, a James Gleason, for the crime, but he was quickly released as there was, there was nothing other than him being in the area to connect him to the attack. I think it's highly unlikely this had really anything to do with the others, anyway. Uh, and five days later, on August 10th, 1918, a much more likely candidate for the Axeman's next victim arose. And the scene was complete with a bloody axe at the scene and a panel on the back door of the property, having been chiseled and pried to provide the attacker entry. So you have the same weapon, same method of entry. It's crazy how ding, ding. Um, many axe murders is it kind of happened around this time period. Like we had like crimes. It's kind of like fashion. Mm. It's a bit cyclical. Like it, uh, yeah. an axe, like axe killing. It was in mega work. But we had, like we had like a Liz, Liz, Lizzie Borden. Yeah, um, she was charged and tried with axe murders for her father what? and her big stepmother. Lizzie yeah, big Lizzie. Uh, the slaughter of the, uh, we talked about before the uh, Velasca, Iowa murders. Do you know what I mean? uh, the 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 Murr family was six members of the Murr family and two house guests, and they were bludgeoned to death with mm. the back of an axe. Nice. Uh, that case was still unsolved, but it was speculated that a man named Paul Mueller was responsible. Okay. Um, it's believed that he travelled through the United States by train between uh, 1898 and 1912 murdering a number of family with axes oh really um, he was a traveling axe man yeah it was they, they, it was speculated like he was he was a lumberjack but all the killings kind of happened in and around these like train stations okay so but there was uh, there was about 14 family murders a total of like 59 victims killed by wow. the back of an axe jeez that's, that is a lot time. yeah yeah but yeah, ton of axe murders around the time. It was, it was very popular, very yeah. popular tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're they're getting their money's worth out of those axes, I guess. In this case, we have victim Joseph Romano, and he was discovered by his two nieces with whom he lived. The sisters found their elderly uncle in his room, where he had been struck in the head with his with an axe. The sisters could see two deep, open cuts on his noodle. The girls, Pauline and Mary Bruno, you'll see a lot of Italians in this story. They both claimed they had been alerted by seeing the assailant fleeing the scene of the crime. And they described the attacker as a heavyset male, dark skin, wearing a dark suit and a slouched hat, which was... What's a slouched hat? Kind of like down, down. It's kind of like the Peaky Blinders? Is that a slouched hat? No, no, no. That's like a paddy cap. Uh, uh, like a, like having a low, like to cover his face, like having the slouched okay. hat, like... Cool. All right. Don't question me ever again or else you're going to forget. Well, so the, the way this guy was dressed, anyway, was like uh, pretty common. So that wasn't like, it wasn't unusual, you know, dress sense. Though this time the house had been ransacked, but it appeared nothing ha had actually been taken. He was probably looking for an axe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, fuck, where's my fucking axe? <laughs> <laughs> They're coming, I hear them. <laughs> I believe I've got my axe again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, this was also the first time the crimes had been linked together. And this is when a real sense of fear and dread had begun to, to spread throughout the city, especially throughout the, the Italian community in New Orleans. And people were in a constant fear of a visit from the X-Men. Yeah, like, as I said, like, it was really after this attack that sent New Orleans into, like, a frenzy. Mm. The idea of mass a mass murder on the loose was, it was really the talk of the town at yeah. the time. Uh, it was the cock of the walk. The cock of the walk. Uh, John D'Antonio, a then retired Italian detective, he even made public statements which he hypothesized that a man who had committed the axe murders was the same uh, who had killed several individuals in 1911. Um, D'Antonio, he described the potential killer as an individual with dual personalities who killed without motive. And this type of individual, D'Antonio stated, could very like could very likely have been a normal law-abiding citizen who was just overcome with an overwhelming desire to kill. He later went on to describe the killer as a real-life Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. At this point, I think he was just making up shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, he probably had just read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He's like, yep, this sounds about right. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what happened. The, the book, uh, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, was published not long before this. Oh. So he must have just been reading that and came up with this theory. Yeah, so, it's I like, whoa, it. yeah. It's a bit like the, the Wonderful Wizard of Oz. That was around the same time. Oh, if he okay. wasn't reading that, it would have been like the Tin Man. With yeah, the exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just got around oh, looking for oh, a heart. Fuck. Yeah. He just realized this is this is not a documentary book. Like, this is a fictional book he was reading. He's like, holy <laughs> yeah, shit. It's like... I've got it. It has doctor in the title. This is scientific. 
However, so Joseph Romano, he had been alert and he'd been conscious after being attacked by the Axeman. He was even able to walk to the ambulance in the hours after the attack. He would die as a result of his wounds two days later in hospital. And so now the police, they became inundated with uh, potential Axeman sightings and nerves. They were afraid. People were seeing the Axeman lurking in, in, in shadows and around every corner. Um, people began to, to speculate about the Axeman and uh, you know whether or not he'd been responsible for, as you said, the several violent axe murderers since since the start of the decade around America, around the, around the country. However, old Joe, Joe Romano, he couldn't give an, the police any helpful helpful uh, information before before passing. Now the next attack, it wouldn't be for another seven months. Did I get the killer? He had a quiet Christmas time, I guess, in 1918. Taking a bit of time. Taking a bit of time. He's celebrating the end of the war. Yeah, a bit of time to himself. Yeah, relaxing. Yeah. Yeah. He's enjoying V for victory time. Yeah, bit in, of me time. Yeah. yeah. Chill out. Yeah, pretty much. But in March 1919, he would strike again. This time it would be pretty brutal, though. He made up for it. He didn't strike for seven months, but he, he you know, he, he was plotting. Yeah, he was plotting. One, this one's, like, fucked up. So Yeah, this is probably his worst one. Buckle in, buckle. Yeah. <laughs> This time, the Axeman visited the home of Charles Cortemiglia, his wife Rosie, and their two-year-old daughter, Mary. The Cortemiglia household lay across the Mississippi River in Gretna, Louisiana, which is a suburb of New Orleans, maybe an hour's walk from Anna Schneider's home on that same side of the river. And late on the night of March 10th, 1919, screams were heard coming from the Cortemiglia house. On arrival, neighbors found a grim, and tragic show. Rosie Cortemiglia was standing in the doorway with blood pumping from her head, and she was clutching the battered body of her infant child, Mary. Little Mary had already died of the severe beating she had sustained. Clearly visible on the floor behind the shocked mother, just inside the room was Charles Cortemiglia. He too had been attacked and was unconscious. The family were rushed to the nearby charity hospital, though it was too late for the youngest, the youngest person. Both parents had suffered badly fractured skulls and were lucky to be alive and both would manage to survive their wounds. Once again, nothing appeared to have been missing from the house and a panel was found to have been pried away from the back door. Nearby on the porch was the Axeman's bloodied tool of choice. I like how we had the forethought to bring like a chisel. Yeah. But he never, like, it was always like, okay, when he left the house, I got my keys, got my wallet, got my chisel. I, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Nah, that's good. I didn't get it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, no, not again. <laughs> <laughs> so, Charles' wounds, though they seemed to be more serious, he was on the ground when, you know, he was unconscious when, when help arrived. He was actually released from hospital after just two days. Hmm. His wife, however, Rosie, she'd be held for intensive care and rehab. Once she regained strength, though, Rosie was interviewed by detectives and she claimed that she knew exactly who had attacked her, who had attacked her husband, and who had murdered their daughter, who was the Axeman. And she was pointing the finger at her neighbor, Orlando Giordano, and his 18-year-old son, Frank. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's a great name. Orlando Giordano, and then... <laughs> Frank. <laughs> Frank Giordano. Well, yeah. That's not too bad when you have the second name. Frank no, Giordano. but just the fact that Orlando and then my son, uh, uh, Frank. Yeah, that'll do. Yeah, that'll do. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, the interesting thing was, Orlando and Frank, they were the people who heard the screams and found the quarterback. They were neighbors who were one of the first people on the scene. They came to the rescue. Yes, exactly. It's bizarre. And Charles Quartermiglia, he was saying, no, neither of the Giordanos were involved. Uh, Orlando was 69 years old already and in seriously poor health anyway. But the police, they ignored the fact that one of the victims said they had nothing to do with it. And one of the suspects was in no position to do it. But they quickly arrested the Giordanos regardless. The police, they're, they don't really mess around in this time. They're pretty quick to arrest. No faffing mm. about. Yeah, yeah. I'll give them that. Evidence. What? Yeah, what's happening? <laughs> so adding to the already obvious, Frank Giordano was six feet tall and over 200 pounds. So there's no way he could have squeezed through the small opening left by chiseling open the back door panel. Incompetency reigned again, sadly, and the two Giordano men, they were charged with the horrific crime. 
and they were actually found guilty after a short trial. They were sentenced to a was it as uh what I I've used this before. It's a short long drop. drop short stop. Long drop, short drop shouldn't short drop sudden stop. That's it. That's the one. Yes, yes, that's it. Short, yeah, why well, you just so geez, that's kind of hard. To it say. is kind of hard to say. Short drop sudden stop. Being hung essentially. They're going to be yeah. hanged or whatever people say. But Charles, he was still maintaining. Gi- Giordano said nothing to to do with this, and he told mm. the police his, his wife is she. She's bullshit. She's lying to you. She's holding you with lies. She's making it up. And Charles would even divorce Rosie after the trial. And it took almost a year for Rosie to finally come clean and admit she had lied. And the Giordanos had not, in fact, killed her daughter and attacked her and her husband. She'd made up the allegations out of pure jealousy and spite. Because the Giordanos were doing better than her. They were earning a few more buckaroos and shows she was like well fuck them <laughs> you know like when i when i read this first i thought what a wagon but like why falsely accuse the men who came to her rescue but in fairness to her like she just lost her two-year-old daughter and she got a axe to the noggin so she was going through some shit she uh no fuck her <laughs> <laughs> i do not share this is that, is that supposed to make me sympathetic to her I'm that she almost see, I'm just trying to see both killed sides. two other innocent men <laughs> nearly, like it's horrific nearly. what happened to her that sucks but no i don't i do not have, I, like all i'm saying I, she probably wasn't her her right frame of mind that's all I'm she saying. had like a long ass time to get into her right frame of mind though like this wasn't like <laughs> a week later like this went on for over a year where she before she finally came clean. okay okay that's I, I can see it as fair enough yeah right <laughs> so the Giordanos were soon uh, released though after she admitted uh, that she had made it up now it says something about the strangeness of this entire case of New Orleans Axeman that the most defining episode of the saga was not a murder or attack at all what happened next is probably the reason that the events surrounding the Axeman of New Orleans are remembered at all today. As I said earlier, right, the Axeman, he shares several elements uh, with the story of Jack the Ripper, which happened, was that like 50 years before when was uh, Saucy Jack active? Was yeah, he? it wasn't too much longer before. Uh, yeah, it wasn't like a whole lot longer. It was like, what, uh, 1880 or something? Oh, maybe it was him. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was him. <laughs> Uh, 18, 1888, yeah. So, mm. not actually, only about 30 years, yeah, not, 40 not years prior. Not a, not terribly long. And one of the biggest overlaps is Jack's enjoyment of writing to the police and the investigators chasing him. And just like saucy Jack, the Axeman would send a message to potential victims on March 13th, 1990. Just three days after the attack on the Cortemiglia family. And, just like Jack... We don't actually know who wrote the letter or if it was from the Axeman at all, but it's a pretty good letter. It's a great letter. This is what the New Orleans Axeman sent out. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axeman. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me, as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. I love how he's just saying the police are pussies, by the way. He's literally just calling the police pussies. <laughs> Undoubtedly, you Orleans think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am. But I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the Angel of Death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15... Earthly time. He, he literally puts it in brackets, in parentheses, earthly time. <laughs> just, as, here, just no to be no sure. confusion here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> on, on next Tuesday night, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions 
that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well then, so much better for you people. <laughs> One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out in that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about my time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that has ever existed, either in fact or realm of fantasy. Do 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 do. And scene. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's good. Brilliant. It's that good. Was really good. I really like that. Yeah, it's a great That's letter. A fantastic letter. It is a great letter. The letter was directed to esteemed mortal and bore the return address of hell, which is this is crazy. Yeah, this guy is a this guy is a wacky. He's from hell, dude. <laughs> is that what? Uh, this that's what Jack Ripper did. Didn't he sign his letters like from hell? From hell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the writer claimed to be not human. Claimed to be a demon. Uh, and essentially, yeah, it's a pretty good letter. I thought that was pretty cool. They were really playing into the supernatural they're that they were. It. Yeah, they yeah. were. Man, they're really. Yeah, they, they were looking it. around. Yeah. yeah, they're getting into the into the spirit of it. I like it. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool letter. By the way, I actually had to Google this. The France jo Francis Joseph mentioned in the letter, um, that was the Emperor of Austria, I believe. But not at the time. Like, he was, like, long dead. And some old, old Austrian. I mean, do Austrians hate Italians? Yeah, I, I think I read I that. Know. He had, like, some mad beef with Italian grocers. Some about being, like, ripped um, off or a panini or something. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, fair enough. So I, I I kind of feel like that that letter like I don't know compared to the crimes yeah the crimes feel like a little sloppy but the letter seems like coming from someone that's really well educated it's a, mm. yeah a bit of a juxtaposition there but it is mm. yeah 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 it's interesting we'll talk a little bit more about that yeah, yeah so not only were people terrified and ready to do anything to keep themselves safe the Tuesday night mentioned in the letter was March nineteenth which was St. Joseph's Day. And probably Italians would be very, you know, there a lot of Italians would be very religious. So there would have been lots of parties and stuff around town. And so with the added threat of a supernatural axe man looming over them in judgment of their musical tastes, people were more than happy to blast out jazz for the axe man. And so people did. It was a wild night in New Orleans, and the Axeman, he was good to his word, and on Tuesday, March 19th, the Axeman would claim no further victims. Ooh. So, like, was this just an old-time viral marketing campaign, or yes. was there something more sinister I, at play? I love it. This is probably my favorite part of this whole story of, like, so, initially reading it, most people who are listening to this probably the same thought. It's some guy who owns a jazz club or is in a jazz band trying to uh, do marketing for yeah. jazz to get work, yeah, right? Yeah. That's the first thing that I thought of. Yeah, yeah. Right, this guy is just like, either I doubt it was the Axe man himself. I'd say it's probably just some random chancer who was yeah. taking the piss. And I was yeah. like, fuck, here, I can do some work now. I'm going to get everybody to play jazz tonight. Logically, yes, but I have some great theories. Go with it. Go with it. Slay, queen. So Tell me your theories. So we all know that Italian Americans made up the majority of his victims. Yes. And this could have been revenge because black musicians weren't getting their due credit. Mm. So the first jazz recording in 1917, so one year prior to the murders, was led by an Italian American named Nick LaRocca from, okay. from New Orleans and his all white original Dixieland jazz band. So it's a controversial record in jazz history because there was no improvisation. So it was like, it was jazz-like, okay. but not jazz. Right. However, this didn't stop LaRocca saying that he and his band were the inventors of jazz. Well, you know, it's about the notes you don't play. <laughs> that is true. But you can see why this might not sit well with black jazz musicians. Jazz was one of the most innovative and original forms of African-American cultural expression. Uh -huh. Then this band comes along 
records like a watered down version of jazz to appeal to the larger American audience and sells millions of copies. So it seems like a good motive to me. In the letter, he, he says, I'm not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. So perhaps a deal was made with the devil to get revenge on the Italian American community. Ah. So after all, blues and jazz considered the devil's music. And the devil is a big player, especially in blues and jazz. Which Robert takes Johnson and all that. Exactly. It's about getting into, there are very similar stories about deals with the devil down south. So, for example, as you said, in the early 1930s, you have a young lad called Robert Johnson, who was just, he was a mediocre blues musician until he went to the crossroads to right. sell his soul. After his meeting with the devil, he became one of the greatest blues musicians of all time and wrote the famous song, Crossroad Blues. Robert Johnson, uh, he died um, and he became the founder of the 27 Club, which would be joined by Kurt Cobain, Jim Morrison, Jimi right. Hendrix and other members who had sadly joined his club as well. But the mystery, however, that followed says that the song Crossroad Blues is a cursed and is, is cursed and performing the song can cause very professional and personal tragedies. So, for example, Lin- Leonard Skinner, they covered a song and was involved in a tragic airplane crash that killed right. three band members. Eric Clapton played it uh, with Cream and he lost his two-year-old son. So, there may be some merit to this theory. The devil, he also, he obviously has a very close affiliation with Southern music. Uh, perhaps the Axeman of New Orleans was a demon from the hottest parts of hell, someone to get revenge on the people trying to take credit for jazz music. Or it was some dickhead with an axe and a random club promoter <laughs> trying to take advantage of a horrible situation. Both theories are pretty good. I think they're both good. It's good, though. It's interesting. It is interesting. I definitely think... Um, I definitely think, I mean, like, why... What the fuck is the axe? They were playing the jazz shit got to do with the axe man. It's definitely a music-related... Oh, definitely, yes. You know, I... I, I but I love the theories. I, I think the theories... Yeah, I think you're probably on the money. I definitely don't think the axe man wrote it, for sure. Oh, God, no. But you know what the axe man did do? Tell me about it. On August 10th, 1919, he struck again. So this was five months after he wrote the letter and attacked the court of Miglias. Another Italian immigrant, a grocer named Steve Boca, was attacked in his bedroom as he slept. Boca, he lived in the French Quarter. So Boca was shocked awake in the night and he fled his house after hearing a commotion. Only when he got outside did he realize he was bleeding from his head. That he himself had been attacked. In the shock, he hadn't realized he had taken an axe to the head. This is like Stephen Porco's dad style. In fact, his head, it had been cracked open. Almost on autopilot, he ran to his neighbor's house where he collapsed and he lost consciousness. The neighbor witnessed Steve run over and collapse. And so the police were called and then an ambulance. Now, Steve Boca later recovered from his injuries, but he couldn't remember anything of his encounter with the Axeman. Yet again, an axe was found, which belonged to the victim, and a panel on the back door had been chiseled open, as we've seen numerous times before. This was the first attack to take place after the infamous letter, but five months after the infamous letter. It's like he kind of strikes just when you're thinking, okay, it's been a while, he's not going to strike again. He strikes again. I'm back. Lures you into a false (laughs) sense of security. I'm back, bitch. (laughs) Also, in keeping with the police's recent tradition of being completely shit, they arrested the neighbor who had called them and kept Steve Boca alive until the ambulance came. Fortunately, this time they were quicker than usual to realize the mistake, and he was released after a short interrogation. And so... The final attacks of the New Orleans Axeman came in quick succession, with the penultimate assault coming on September 3rd, 1919. 19-year-old Sarah Lauman's neighbors heard a commotion coming from her home, and after knocking several times and receiving no answer, they broke open the front door and entered. That's where they found the young girl lying unconscious in her bed. The girl had an obvious head injury and was spattered with blood. The neighbors who found her also saw that she was missing several teeth and she'd been badly beaten. That was confirmed later when a bloody axe was found outside the apartment, as in other attacks. And the would-be killer had used the blood side of a hatchet to batter the girl. The attacker, this time though, got a lucky break. Didn't need to chisel open no door, a window had been left open. 
to win though of course <laughs> yeah. this whole time I've been chis- chiseling <laughs> yeah. at the back door like a goddamn caveman <laughs> the whole time. why did I never think to look at the window <laughs> Now, Sarah Levin, she would eventually recover from her injuries, but she was unable to recall anything that might help investigators. Though, given how help from, you know, previous victims is gone, it's probably for the best. She couldn't really remember anything. She would have been like, Santa Claus did it. (laughs) (laughs) And so, the final victim and fatality of the Axeman came nearly two months after the attack on Sarah Levin. It happened just before Halloween on October 27th. This time, there was a witness who had not recently suffered severe brain trauma. Mike Pepitone was attacked in his bedroom when his wife heard a struggle and ran to see what was happening. She got to his bedroom just as two large men were fleeing the scene with what looked like a bloody axe in one of her hands. She immediately went to check on her husband and was stunned by the sight she found. The bedroom walls were covered with her husband's blood and Mike was drenched, having been hit hard in the head with a makeshift axe. The weapon this time was actually a pipe with an attached wing nut. His wife and the couple's seven children who were home at the time of the attack were left unharmed. Mrs. Pepitone, probably in shock, could only describe the men as one being tall and the other being short. So two men. Two men this time, yeah. Axe men. Axe men. Yeah, ooh. Ooh. It was Magneto, um, <laughs> Professor X. <laughs> yeah. Later, investigators, uh, they brought out witnesses who claimed to have seen the two men, Italians, lurking around the Pepitone's home. With nothing taken and the occupation of the deceased Mr. Pepitone being a grocer, well, that was a common occupation with a lot of these attacks. And so police and locals, they saw enough in common with the earlier murders to link him to the earlier attacks. But that was the final attack. So, who was the Axeman of New Orleans? Now, I think for sure not all of these. I'm get, I'm doing the thing where I... What do you call this move where you put your fingers together like in an arch? It's like the evil supervillain move. Just, I just want the podcast to visualize. I'm, I'm being very thoughtful right now. Yeah, all the fingers put together. And like fingers a triangle spread out. Yeah. yeah. What is that? I, I think it's an arch. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. it doesn't matter. E- yeah, the evil villain. If was... I have to explain it, it's not working. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I definitely... Oh, so all of these attacks were definitely not done by the same guy. And I'm pretty sure a lot of these... I mean, the last one sounds like that was his mafia. Yeah. He was a grocer who they were just killing because he probably hadn't paid them. I mean, if it was one, two men with a makeshift axe. Yeah. Had they read in a newspaper how he gained entry and shit like that? Mm. That one I definitely think was probably mafia related. I mean, you know, Italian and shit. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a it's a weird one. It's it's pretty interesting. It definitely is spawning, you know, spawns all this like serial killer axe men. But who exactly he was? Likely a question that won't be answered anytime soon. I mean, over a hundred years later, all we have is speculation, and ironically, it's probably idle speculation that caused the fear and tensions surrounding the case in the first place. We don't even know if any of the murders at all were committed by the same person. Let alone, I mean, no, well, definitely not all of them. And there's also, you know, the theory that some of the murders were committed by a copycat serial killer. Uh, people looking to place the blame, the Axeman, which I think is extremely likely that there was definitely um, some people who, you know, used the fear to their advantage mm. to get rid of some person, yeah. get rid of some people they didn't like. It's on stuff like the letter and stuff like that. Um, and also, to add to that, there was a spate of lynchings against immigrant Italians in the first decade of the 20th century. And so, you know, it's it's yeah, that kind of makes it easier to understand why the idea of a supernatural figure persecuting the community was so easy to believe. And, you know, it's even easier to understand why people were willing to jazz it when they were told. They Probably a lot of people did believe there actually was a supernatural figure haunting the streets of New Orleans. Yeah. And th- there was there was a huge amount of anti-Italian sentiment in New Orleans at the time. The uh, the New Orleans mayor at the time of the of the lynchings that you mentioned, he expressed anti-Italian prejudice in a letter that he wrote complaining that the city had become attractive to th- This is a quote, not my own horrible thoughts. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> the worst classes of Europe uh sorry the worst classes of Europe, Southern Italians and Sicily and Sicilians, 
the most idle, vicious and worthless people among us. He claimed that they were filthy in their persons and homes and blamed them for the spread of disease, concluding that they were without courage, honour, truth, pride, religion or any quality that goes to make a good citizen. Again, this is coming from the mayor of New Orleans, an elected official. He said this in a letter. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Keith hates <laughs> Italians. Those are his words. He's putting in the mouth of an innocent mayor of New Orleans. <laughs> He, he was mayor for six years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it, I can, obviously I completely disagree with it, but, you yeah. know, during these times of a lot of immigration, you also get a lot of, you know, racism yeah. Yeah. in oppo but, opposition to it. So yeah. he probably would have done well on that platform of yeah. hating Italians. Because, like, the world, like, 1918, that was the same time as the, um, the Spanish flu. In, in uh, 1918, and they're probably yeah, they, maybe yeah. they were like Italians bringing over the flu from Europe, and that kind of stuff, yeah, helping like, spread it. Yeah, like there, there's a huge history of blaming immigrants for disease in America. Uh, the 18, Everywhere. Yeah, the the 1830s, Im, Irish immigrants they were stigmatized for the bearers of cholera. Yeah, which is typhoid enough. Mary. Something yeah, like, like the symptoms of cholera is vomiting and acute diarrhea, which is the same symptoms as a vicious hangover. Yeah. The the 19th <laughs> century, <laughs> yeah. The tuberculosis, that was the Jewish disease. And then two years prior to the 1918 influenza, Italian immigrants, again, they were blamed for polio. So uh. I guess it's not like a far stretch for it, like two years later when like you've the Spanish flu coming in and you've the mayor, uh, like yeah. all this anti-Italian propaganda going go on. For sure. Like, oh, this is probably... Yeah, again. I mean, here that even recently, it like in our day, you see with COVID, there was a rise yeah. in anti-Asian, uh, exactly. yeah. like racism and shit like yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you see it all the time yeah. with with COVID and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's just some madman taking it to own hands. Yeah, yeah, but that is the story of the X-Man of New Orleans, uh, an unsolved mystery over one hundred years later, one that I think at this point likely will never be solved. He could still be out there. Mm, yes, he could. I mean, technically, he could be. Yeah, anything is possible. Maybe he is a demon. Stranger things have happened. Stranger things have happened. All right, and we will leave it there for now. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. I do appreciate you taking the time to listen to this whole episode of the That Chapter Podcast as I'm joined once again by my best buddy, Keith. Thanks for being here, Keith. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Always fun. Yes, I'm always having a great time. The podcast Savo Keith are by far my favorite to do because it's a lot more fun because we can just shoot the shit and talk about these cases. So yeah, um, here, listen, I guess we'll leave it there. So next episode of the podcast, every Monday is a brand new episode of the That Chapter podcast. But also please check out the That Chapter YouTube channel where there's a new episode every Tuesday and every Friday. So give it a go. But until then, please take care of each other and yourselves because I love you. You can say it too if you want. I love you too. Great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> like it.